Hi everyone, my name is Bethany Badaferano, and I'm really delighted to be here as part of Renegade Opera's Artists in Conversation Deconstruct series, where I'll be able to speak on programming in the choral arts, particularly from a DEI perspective. Before we begin, I want to give you a sense of the parameters for this presentation. So first, the intended audience is artists who operate in predominantly white choral contexts in the United States. That's because that's how I identify. I am a white choral artist who operates in predominantly white choral arts spaces in the U.S. It's also because there's a great need for DEI conversations to be happening within predominantly white choral arts contexts, and they're, they're really just beginning to happen and need to be spurred along. That said, this conversation is obviously enriched by many diverse voices, and people of all backgrounds are very much encouraged to be here, and we all benefit from your perspectives. So those of you who aren't operating in predominantly white choral contexts, wherever that may be, you're more than welcome to participate, and we are grateful to you for participating. Particularly, we would benefit from your feedback in the Q&A section if you would like to participate. My background in regards to this material is that I've been working with a group called Border Crossing, which I co-founded with director Ahmed Ansaldua several years ago, where we have been focusing on Latinx choral music and general DEI practices in the choral arts. Uh, together with Ahmed and several other colleagues, I've been developing a holistic, comprehensive DEI in the choral arts guideline to be set up on a website sometime very soon. It will be coming to you soon. And so this presentation on programming of repertoire within choral context is just one piece of that greater swath of research that I've been able to conduct over the past eight years or so. I encourage you to take screenshots throughout the presentation so that you can log some of these resources. I will remind you as we get to those spots where it might be helpful for you to take screenshots screenshots of some resources, but take a second and just remind yourself how to take a screenshot on your computer so that you have that handy when, when that comes up. Finally, yes, there will be a Q&A session after this presentation, and again, I would encourage anyone and everyone to attend that, to offer feedback, experience, to ask questions, and to generally have conversation with one another, because that's really, really how this, uh, how this work moves forward, DEI work through conversation. Before I get into the meat of this presentation, I want to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what DEI is and why it's important. So first, DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And diversity I define as the inclusion of different types of people, things, or ideas. And when we think of types of people, we can think of the categories that we use in everyday life, race, ethnicity, cultural background, gender, age, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, ability, etc. Equity I define as fairness through the removal of bias and barriers, and the provision of extra support to those who do face bias or barriers, all in the pursuit of equality. Inclusion, I source a definition from Archway programs, is the act of authentically bringing traditionally excluded individuals and or groups into processes, activities, and decision or policy making in a way that shares power and ensures equal access to opportunities and resources. And so when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion working together, it should come as no surprise that terms like accessibility, relevance, representation, transparency, and accountability all fall under that DEI work and are all necessary in order for DEI work to be effective. The reason it's important is, as I hope and I, I believe all of us will be aware, Systemic discrimination is very, a very real problem in the United States and in the West generally. And we are hyper aware right now of racism in the U.S. with the murder of George Floyd this summer and the ensuing discussions about racism and our roles in it across all industries. We also face things like sexism, homophobia, ageism, etc. And so it's important to be thinking about because these issues are so ingrained in our cultural life and all of us 
hold implicit biases related to these issues, it's important for us to be confronting them, thinking about them, and questioning how we interact with them and how we can change them on a daily, day-to-day basis in our operations. Within the choral arts, I think it can be helpful to separate our DEI work into sections. And so the way that I have conceptualized it is to separate into organizational structures and operations within choral arts, community engagement within the choral arts, and artistic operations within the choral arts. And my video may be blocking that bottom right corner. I hope not. But the good news is, for if it is blocking some of those artistic operations, that's the bulk of what we'll talk about today. So we'll get to that in a moment. But I'll let you read those subheadings for each of those sections. I won't get into them because those are discussions for another day. But these are all areas of DEI and choral arts that it's important for us to be aware of and to start to work towards. This presentation will focus mainly in, our, in artistic operations and specifically on the way we program and execute repertoire within our choral arts systems. As we pursue more diverse, equitable, and inclusive practices in the choral arts, I think it can be really helpful to first acknowledge the reasons why we might not engage in DEI work or why we might not have so far. So first we have our systems of education, of performance, and of business operations that are just fundamentally rooted in these systems of discrimination that we have and in these white Western European focused systems that don't allow for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have a lack of exposure to DEI issues. Sometimes we have a disbelief in the importance of DEI issues. This often um, subconscious belief that Western classical traditions are superior to other traditions. We often see that in co comments that Western classical choral traditions are more complex or more beautiful or more X, Y, and Z than whatever non-Western European context. There is also um, a resignation to the current state of affairs or a resistance to change. And we see this in people saying, well, that's just the way it is, or there's nothing I can do about it. There's also a really common sense that the whatever expertise we hold has to exclude diverse repertoire. And the reason we believe that is because of our education systems, because we were taught our certain uh, area of expertise was probably rooted in Western European-derived systems. The exciting thing is that that uh, is almost never the case that whatever our specialty area is, whether it be a time period from as early as the medieval period to the present, or whether it be a particular region of the world, there is always, always diversity within that specialty area, and it just requires finding it. There's also a similarly a lack of exposure to diverse repertoire because of our education systems, um, a belief that DEI work requires too many resources in terms of investment of time or investment of finances, and also the fear of messing up, the worry that someone might call us out or that we might make a mistake. I read through those quickly because I don't want us to, to dwell on them too much because the great thing about engaging in DEI work is you learn quickly that there are ways to counteract all of these barriers. Most of it just involves informing ourselves and educating ourselves and as much as we can, reforming our systems that we operate in. And as choral artists, we have the great opportunity to reform our performance systems. And we can pretty effectively do that as choral artists by engaging in discussion with directors, with other choral artists, with other musicians in general, developing partnerships with our communities and gradually creating change. And so many of these things are just about committing to change, believing that it can happen, seeing it happen around us and being inspired by that and taking one step at a time to find ways to creatively make it work. And each one of these areas of barriers will be kind of threaded throughout this presentation. You'll see them emerge in different ways and see how we can get around them and, and um, confront them and, and overcome them so that we can really engage in DEI work in a supported and exciting way. 
Here's a slide where it might be helpful for you to take a screenshot. I won't read through all of these, but they are just a handful of helpful introductory resources when we think about programming repertoire from a DEI perspective, becoming more diverse, inclusive, and equitable in our programming. So I encourage you to look up each of these articles and roundtables and to just uh, familiarize yourself with them. They will come up again in the bibliography at the end, so you, if you miss the screenshot now, you can wait till the end and get the screenshot in the formal bibliography. As we think about programming diversely, equitably, and inclusively, four major guidelines come to mind. First is to listen intently to your community, and particularly to discussions that are happening around diversity, equity, and inclusion. You'll recall earlier when I talked about the main aspects of DEI work in the choral arts, I mentioned community engagement. And a really important part of our programming can be sourced from discussions with the community and ways to engage in the preparation and rehearsal and performance of that repertoire can be gauged from our community as well. That will be more become more clear in upcoming slides. Second, we need to consider the implicit messages that we communicate through our choices. That will also become more clear. But as we program certain kinds of repertoire and don't program certain other kinds of repertoire, as we program some languages but not others, as we roster white musicians and maybe not black musicians, all of these choices that we make send messages subconscious or conscious, implicit or explicit, to the people who are engaging with our work and with our performances. And so every time we make a decision, we need to be considering what message does this send to my community? What message does this send to my colleagues and to the other people who are engaging with my work? Third, we can arrange for and support dialogue in DEI work. This is one of the most important things to do is to find a community, to find a colleague, to find resources to be reading and listening to where you can feel like you're in dialogue with DEI issues because we all will have so many questions about the work we're doing and how we can individualize it to DEI work that again all of this DEI work needs to be part of an ongoing conversation and the more support and dialogue you can engender as part of that the more um fruitful your process will be and the more likely we are to engage long term with that work. Finally, as part of all of the work we do in programming, we want to be hiring subject experts from the community and I will give more specific information on that in the coming slides. The main facets I'll focus on for consideration of programming from a DEI perspective will be the repertoire, rostering, preparing, rehearsing, and presenting. Standard practice for programming repertoire in predominantly white choral arts communities in the United States is to program repertoire from Western Europe or the United States, typically by white, cisgendered, heterosexual male composers. So by that framework, we can see pretty clearly that there isn't a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion within our current programming standards. And what DEI work does do is to put us in conversation, all of us, in conversation with one another in our communities and to help us to celebrate and reflect and represent and engage with diversity across all of our communities to create more healthful relationships and to repair the relationships within our communities as well and to reflect respect for all communities. And so one of the great ways that we can begin programming diversely is to look around at our communities and engage with all of our communities and think about how we can represent all of our communities, not just our corner of white choral arts communities in our programming. So for example, we can think about what, language are, what languages are spoken in our communities. What kinds of racial and ethnic identities and national identities are there in our local communities? 
what kinds of genders do we see represented in our communities and how can we take all of these elements and think about repertoire the repertoire's origins whether it be a genre's origins or individual composers origins and or languages uh, represented in repertoire and think about representing our communities within the work that we present and representational work is a large part of DEI in that it is so important for people to see themselves reflected in the content presented to them around them. And for those of us who are white and for those who are men, we are used to seeing that in the United States and in choral arts communities, we, we very often see ourselves reflected in the content that is programmed. Um, for anyone who does not fall into those two categories, it's much more difficult to feel represented and to see representation. And so it's really important for us in DEI work to think about how to more um, accurately and ethically represent all of our communities in the work that we do. To that end, we can program from diverse resources, and I've included in this presentation, in the bibliography, uh, a section, a truncated section of resources that I've been compiling over the last several years. Again, it's, it's I think, eight resources that I provide out of, you know, dozens, um, but, but these are some really helpful resources to have, so please do stick around for the bibliography to see those resources. Another important point to consider when we're programming repertoires to think about integrating all works authentically in the program. So for example, we don't what we don't want to do is have token diversity works that don't fit in with the rest of the program. And when I say token diversity, I mean a work that is used just to check the box of saying, oh, I've done something diverse. Now I can move on from that and I don't have to think about it very much. Rather than really genuinely engaging in all repertoire to the same degree and with the same level of respect um, and, and intention. And so we want to make sure that if we're programming a program, a whole program by a theme, let's say 17th century sacred Catholic music, we don't want to suddenly substitute in a token diversity work of uh, from Ghana from the 21st century that is secular. While it's wonderful to program something from Ghana from the 21st century that's secular, if it doesn't fit into the rest of the program, it kind of flags for audience members and anyone engaging with the content that you're not really you may not really be taking it seriously. It may just serve as a function to offset the rest of the repertoire and and point you out as saying, oh, I can do something diverse. So we want to make sure that we're really authentically integrating all repertoire into these programs that, that we're constructing. And if we want to perform repertoire from 21st century Ghana that's secular, that's wonderful. We can program it among other secular music from the 21st century or by some other thematic element. The next point was consider programming from rote traditions. And so this, I think, is helpful to think about the ways that we impose value judgments on different kinds of music. Typically, in white choral arts contexts, we really value written music, score-based music. And that is oftentimes reflected as white music. It's oftentimes a colonized form of music that has been spread in terms of written music. And oftentimes when we think about rote music or music learned by ear, it that often coincides with being music from communities of color. Not always, but, but often. And so when we value written music over music learned by rote or by ear, oftentimes what we're doing is, is actually valuing white traditions over traditions of color. That isn't always the case, but it can often become that way, and it can result from these implicit biases that we hold from living within a racist system. So we want to be really careful to examine these value hierarchies that we have and to really critically consider rote traditions, learning by ear, are just as valuable and just as valid as, as uh, written-based traditions. And so for us to program rote traditions can be really important and a wonderful way 
for those of us who aren't familiar with rote traditions to learn and to experience new ways of making music and learning music. I'm going to skip this next one and go to the final one for a second. Be willing to perform works without existing recordings because sometimes, since some music from traditions of color or from uh, women's traditions might not be as frequently performed, they might also be less recorded. And so we might sometimes have to work without recordings. That said, there are lots of recordings of lots of repertoire by Black composers, by Indigenous and Native American composers, by Latinx composers, by women composers. We can find lots and lots of recordings out there if our choirs do require it, but choirs do require it. But it is helpful for us to be operating in ways that don't require recordings so that we can expand our ability to to perform music that has been underperformed and underrecorded, which often coincides with being music from traditions of color or women's traditions, etc. And finally, dialogue about what not to program. This goes back to one of the resources I presented in the earlier in the slide prior to this, saying um, not to perf not to perform blackface minstrel songs for very good reason. So we want to be thinking about what are this the genres of music or music that carry really um, heavy histories with them that white choral artists or choral artists in predominantly white choral contexts might not have the right to perform or might not be sending the most diverse, equitable, and inclusive messages if they are performing. And we'll continue discussing that in the upcoming slides. Rostering is another really helpful way for us to be engaging with our communities and representing our communities. So we can reflect local communities in our rostering by using color conscious and culture conscious rostering. That is to say that we shouldn't roster in colorblind ways and more and more the theater arts, opera, and across the performing arts are moving away from colorblind rostering for the same reason that we recognize in our conversations about race and society in general, that there is no such thing as being colorblind, and that race and ethnicity play a really important role in all of our work. And so to embrace that and recognize that it's important to be conscious of color and culture in our rostering is an important way to move forward, forward with DEI work. That's especially important when we're performing works from communities of color, from communities from particular ethnic, racial, or cultural backgrounds. So for example, if we are wanting to perform spirituals or gospels based in the African American tradition, it's important for us to really think about if I have a predominantly or wholly white choir, is it appropriate for me to be performing these works from the African-American tradition. And we'll be speaking in the upcoming slides about this same issue in regards to a couple different ways of looking at it. And it's something that is disputed and hotly discussed by, by many people, and there are different perspectives on it. And I, I would just encourage all of us to really critically think about what messages we're sending when we use rostering in either cultural conscious and color conscious ways or in color blind ways, particularly when it's done within repertoire that itself is very clearly rooted in a cultural, racial, ethnic, or very specifically historical context. It's also really important to roster musicians of equal professional levels for all of the different traditions that we perform. So for example, if you're performing Western European music next to music from Peru, you want to make sure that for the Western European music, if you're using fully professional musicians, you also should be using fully professional musicians for the music from Peru. That includes percussion traditions. So what's a really common thing to see happen is that if we, for example, again, if we perform something from Peru and maybe we roster the cajon 
we oftentimes will see amateur musicians, sometimes even children, students, being rostered to play those instruments, while on the next piece from Western Europe, we have fully professional musicians playing every single instrument. And that's true for the whole rest of the program. So we want to be careful to think about what are the implicit messages I'm sending and what are the implicit beliefs that I have about these different kinds of repertoire and different kinds of racial, cultural, ethnic traditions if I am rostering some of them consistently at professional levels and rostering others of them consistently not at professional levels. And oftentimes that can reflect that we don't take traditions of color as or colonized traditions as seriously as we take white traditions and colonizing traditions. We don't respect that they both require the same level of professionalism, the same level of expertise. So these are important for us to be thinking about. Really similarly, it's important to roster musicians based on their expertise. So for example, you wouldn't want to roster, uh, even, if she, even if she is professional, a professional vocalist to play the cajon because she's not an expert in the cajon. You should roster a professional cajon player, ideally, or at least a professional percussion player to play the cajon. Again, because you wouldn't roster a professional singer to play the harpsichord professionally, unless they were also a professional harpsichord player, typically. So just thinking about the decisions that we are making in our individual context, which will vary from choir to choir, and thinking about how we can make those decisions equitable between the different kinds of repertoire that we're producing and what implicit messages they send about the values that we hold or the beliefs that we hold about different traditions. We also can consider the necessary changes to our audition practices to make it possible for us to have the opportunity to even use color conscious and culture conscious rostering. If we are auditioning in ways that we only attract white musicians who are trained in Western European exclusively styles, then we're not going to have the opportunity to roster in color conscious and color conscious ways because we're we're not making our programming accessible to people of color. And so for us to think about different ways that we can audition, that we can publicize auditions, that we can um, engender genuine relationships across our communities so that we are naturally engaging with all of our diverse communities are things to really consider. Those are things that are also discussed in the broader website that I'm developing about these conversations, particularly about community engagement, um, but they're important to think about here as well in a general sense. From a directorial perspective, as we prepare repertoire before we step into the rehearsal room with our musicians, we want to be sure that we are preparing in, in diverse, equitable, and inclusive ways. The first thing to note is that we should do our own research. Because of the fact that this repertoire isn't commonly performed, sometimes when it is performed, even by world-renowned ensembles, it's not performed in diverse, equitable, or inclusive ways, or ways that are culturally informed. So don't be fooled by seeing a recording of a famous ensemble performing the piece that you want to perform and just perform it the same way that they perform it. It could well be that they have performed it in uninformed ways. Perhaps they haven't studied the language. Perhaps they haven't really researched the musical or historical context. And those things can have really deep um, influences on the ways that we prepare, perform, and present the repertoire. So we want to be sure that we're doing our own research and not just blindly following the example set by others, even if those others are reputable professional musicians. Next, we want to make sure that we study languages and dialects, scores, and musical contexts carefully. As far as languages and dialects go, particularly when we think about colonized cultures, languages themselves are a site of violence. So if you think about a colonizing culture, like um, say, for example, a, a country from Western Europe moving into the Americas, there were, was the extermination of and genocide of the people who lived here in the Americas, and there was also the eradication of their languages, and they were forbidden from speaking them, forbidden from educating their 
following generations to speak and to write and to listen and understand their own languages. And so when we think about performing indigenous repertoires or repertoire from black communities, African communities, we want to be really respectful of the fact that if we are white artists ourselves, we carry a history of colonization in our past. And in some ways, whether we intend it or not, we are, we can be representative of a colonizing force. And so it's important for us to really, really respect the languages that we're working with and take them seriously and spend time with them, recognizing that there is a lot of trauma involved in the communities who speak those languages or are descended from communities who speak those languages and demonstrating respect for and appreciation for that history is part of taking languages seriously and, and producing them with genuine care and respect. As far as scores and musical context goes, there's so much we can see in a score, or again, if we're learning by ear, about what instruments might have been used, uh, what the cultural context was, um, what other musical elements there are, like rhythms. Maybe things aren't written in the score, but we can deduce from cultural context and from historical knowledge that certain instruments might have been added ad lib to the music. So we want to really study the score carefully and listen to the score. It's important to understand that that cultural context so that we don't simply make uninformed choices about how to interpret the score. So for example, we want to really follow our informed choices in terms of we don't want to, if we're performing, um, let's say from a musical tradition from colonial Peru or colonial Mexico, for example, we don't want to just add percussion, ad lib, willy nilly, without any information. We want to first Think about what what kind of context was this? Would there have been percussion played in this context? What kind of percussion would have played? What specific instrument would have been played? What specific rhythms would it have played? There were many um, enslaved African peoples in Mexico and Peru at the time, along with many different um, indigenous peoples. And so influences on music were really diverse and on rhythms and on instruments were really diverse. So we want to really be informed, again, because of these heavy and important historical contexts to produce music in respectful ways that are culturally and historically performed as to how, how it would have been done and um, how f folks who are descended from those communities or who are still living among those communities would know that this should be performed. I'm going to skip one bullet point and jump because it's relevant to honor cultural, historical, and sacred contexts. Along those lines, if we, if we understand and study the cultural, historical, and sacred context, we're going to be aware of what kinds of repertoire we need to treat in certain ways. So for example, if it's sacred, we want to be thinking about in this community, what does sacred music mean? Where would it have been performed? Does it mean that there may or may not have been percussion or other instruments associated with it? Would it always have been a cappella? There are so many different ways that different cultures deal with sacred music and different expectations for how that music will be performed. And so really the only way we can know that is to dig in and study um, the historical, sacred, and cultural context for each of those situations. And along those lines... We want to hire subject experts for, for training. And I say hire, and I mentioned it earlier in the slides, because oftentimes, if we're thinking about diverse repertoire and possibly we're performing something from a, a culture of people of color, we oftentimes expect, we meaning white people, oftentimes expect people of color to do free labor for us. And so just to phone up the person of color we know who knows how to speak the indigenous language that we're trying to present in this piece and expect them to give us the free language, the free labor of teaching us how to do that is not appropriate and is not respectful. If we want to use their time 
in a way, in a professional capacity that's going to help us in a professional capacity in our music career, we should be paying them for that time as professionals and supporting and amplifying their work and their labor and their voices. And so we do want to really engage in these community experts we have at all levels, whether they are experts in these musical traditions that we're looking at, whether they're experts in the language that we're performing, or whether they have cultural backgrounds that are otherwise related to what we're performing. We, we really want to be engaging with them, and we also want to be paying them for their time. Finally, we want to choose instruments in culturally informed ways, in the ways that I was discussing a moment ago. For example, if we're looking at uh, colonial Peru, there are percussion instruments that are sacred. And so oftentimes when today in white choral context we perform Peruvian colonial music, someone will just pull in the bongo, a 12-year-old kid will hop on and they'll just start playing, you know, some rhythm they were told to play or maybe they just made up on the spot. And it's important to know that there are historical, sacred percussion instruments that may have been played in this Peruvian repertoire that you're playing, and it would have been played in very particular ways, in very particular contexts, with a sacred atmosphere, and by people who were dedicated to playing those instruments at, at a professional level, in a, in a, in a, with high expertise. And so we want to make sure that we are choosing instruments appropriately, rather than choosing a bongo, which is several centuries and several uh, countries off base. Um, it's actually a continent off, off base, um, in terms of how we're programming. And just to really be culturally informed in the choices that we're making, particularly when we think about percussion choices across many different cultures. Something that commonly happens when we move from the stage of directorial preparation to working with choral musicians in the room is that the directorial preparation stays in its own silo and the musicians never access it, either because they're not given that information or because they simply choose not to engage with it. I can say that I myself am guilty of this as a choral musician. Sometimes when we walk into the rehearsal room, we want to just be able to sing the music, get the notes right, figure out the rhythms, sound pretty, and call it a day. And so it's really important for both directors and choral, the other choral musicians in the room to think about ways that we can engage and integrate with the whole process of DEI work. So a helpful thing is to invest rehearsal time really explicitly in DEI practices. The director can sit down at the beginning of each rehearsal and catch musicians up to speed on the research that they've been doing, on the things that they've learned, on the cultural, historical, sacred contexts in which this music is taking place. Of course, they'll also be teaching musicians how to pronounce these languages, or they will have already provided resources for musicians to pronounce maybe unfamiliar languages that they're singing in. Another important thing to do is to hire language experts to help musicians understand and speak and pronounce languages to the highest degree. Again, to communicate a, a true respect for the language and for the culture and the people associated with it, and oftentimes violent histories associated with them, and also to, to really do justice to the music. As part of that, we can facilitate engagement by asking musicians to really engage with subject experts in the room who can do activities together, practice together, and give feedback together. And in this day and age, we can have virtual visits to accomplish these um, teaching trainings in really effective ways, which is a phenomenal skill that we, phenomenal tool now that we have at our disposal. So if maybe a subject expert doesn't live in our city, we can still have them 
zoom in from across the country or wherever they may be. One really important thing to evaluate when we are starting the singing process or the music making process in the rehearsal room is to evaluate our aesthetic preferences for vocal sounds. A lot of times what we prefer aesthetically in general, in any context, is influenced by the culture that we are born and raised in. And because we have, uh, we are, we white choral artists are part of a culture that, like we have mentioned before, is, has systemic racism and other forms of discrimination integrated into it, we often have aesthetic preferences that, without us intending them to be, can be racist. And so, for example, we can have a preference for certain vocal sounds over preference for certain other vocal sounds that actually really just reflect a preference for traditionally white sounds over traditionally black sounds or indigenous Native American sounds, etc. So that can be um, reflected in the language that we use in the classroom. We want to really carefully reflect on the language that we use to describe timbres and techniques so that we can catch our own biases and not impose them on others in the rehearsal room. For example, we should not use sweeping racial and cultural descriptions of sound. So things saying, like saying an African vocal sound. Africa is a very large continent comprised of many, many different vocal traditions and reducing uh, an ethnic descriptor to a tiny, tiny window of sound that is also often looked down upon is based in systemic discrimination and can often um, lead to really uncomfortable relationships with people who might be African or are descendants of African people in the room. We can also be sure to avoid degrading and misrepresentative words along with that, like words like raw and ugly, untrained and unrefined, especially again, when we're talking about traditions that are related to cultures of color. And we also want to be aware that um, expectations of things like straight tone or vibrato and anywhere in between have really complex relationships with our understandings of race and racial sounds and how we impose race onto sounds. And they also have a lot to do with gendered sounds and how we think about how women should sound, for example, or how young boys should sound, or whether we want adult women to sound like young boys and thinking about whether these things are possible, what they communicate about our values, how problematic they are in different contexts, and really just this is a process of reconsidering our concepts of our aesthetic preferences, thinking about the negative impacts they could have upon people in our communities, and dialoguing with people in our communities to ask, how does, how does this appear to you? When I use this language, how do you feel about that? And hopefully we will be lucky enough that, that people in our communities will be able to give us feedback and be willing to give us feedback. So the moment we arrive at our presentation or performance is obviously a really exciting moment. We've done all the work, we've done all the preparation and rehearsing, and we're ready to put this music on its feet and, and have an audience engage with it. Before we do that, when we step on stage, it's a really great practice to create and to deliver a land acknowledgement statement. I've included in the bibliography a really helpful resource to walk you through what a land acknowledgement statement is, how to create one, and how to del deliver one. In short, it's a way for especially white individuals, but for everyone, to acknowledge the indigenous people whose land we live on and to acknowledge and honor their sacrifices for the land through the genocidal history that they have endured and to respect the way that they have cared for the land. It also is really helpful for us to get to know the indigenous communities who live in community with us 
because many of us aren't aware And it gives us a great opportunity to engage with Indigenous communities, to respect them, and and to demonstrate that respect and to learn about them. When we actually start the performance, the content that we have prepared to, to sing and play, it can be really helpful either in program notes or in verbal statements to the audience to provide a broader context and tell a truer history in true DEI form for the music that we're presenting. So if we're performing music even from white Western Europe or the United States, we can provide a more diverse, inclusive context for that repertoire. In other words, if we're, prov- if we're performing something from Germany by a German composer, we can still talk about, well, was there a woman of color living in Germany who was also composing? Or where were other people composing at that same time period around the world in more diverse practices? And of course, if you're presenting music from diverse perspectives from around the world, you can also provide, obviously, the context that they are taking place in. And all of that is really, really a great way to engage in public education as we share our process with the audience. We can share our learning process, our goals, um, our, our DEI figurations for our values, and also our doubts and challenges. That's actually one of the most uh, crucial places for learning, I think, is to very transparently communicate with the audience. Well, I, I have doubts that, you know, this is maybe not the right performance practice, but this is the work I did to help determine how to perform this music. And, you know, we had challenges with this language, but we were so lucky to have this a language expert give us lessons and so you can talk about the learning process and ways that you still have room for growth and this helps to engage the public in the learning process themselves and to provide inspiration for them to also pursue, pursue that kind of learning knowing that each of us is in a process of engaging with diversity equity and inclusion at our own pace and in our own ways and I skipped one quick uh, bullet point. It's important, obviously, to credit the originators of works. Oftentimes, we don't consider crediting broad genres with their originators. In Western European-derived classical traditions, we have this obsession with individuality and the individual composer. That's not true across all cultures. And so oftentimes, there are communally produced genres that come from different cultures and they don't feature a specific composer and so if we are performing a genre like that we should be sure to give context for the culture that it is representing. As I close here today I want to make a comment about the feeling that DEI work and the choral arts might require a lot of time or extra financial resources And I think that throughout this presentation, that might have occurred to you a couple of times, just the number of things we have to think about, because we're educating ourselves in ways that we hadn't been previously educated in our institutions. There are really useful ways to flip our practices so that we can avoid incurring extra time or or extra financial resources that we might not have access to. So, for example, one way is if we find ourselves spending a lot of extra time informing ourselves about diverse cultural histories, for example, that might cut away from the preparation time, the rehearsal time that we have. Um, And so we might not be able to provide or present as much music. So we might end up with a concert that's a bit shorter because we've prepared less music so we could spend more time preparing the cultural context. If you're feeling like your concert is too short as a result, you can simply fill the rest of the concert by, like I was just describing, sharing with your audience the context, sharing stories that you uncovered along the way, um, sharing specific repertoire-specific information or culturally-specific information that's relevant to what you're doing. You can even do readings from that time period that are related to it. We can get very creative in the ways that we use our time. And if we spend more time in one area, we can always cut it in another area, present less repertoire, fill it with ad lib speaking about your process. Audiences appreciate that. And you can be transparent about that. 
as well. Uh, in terms of other financial resources, if you're spending more money hiring a language expert to come in and teach you, for example, how to pronounce Nahuatl, a Mexican uh, indigenous language, then you can possibly consider other ways to cut financial resources like finding a venue to perform in for free or holding a um, fundraiser specifically to fund your Nahuatl language coach for your choir. These are things that communities are craving. They're craving DEI work and they're looking for ways to support it. And so community partnerships might give you ways to cut spending. Individuals in your communities might be willing to provide financial resources in order for you to pursue DEI resources. There are so, so many ways for us to get around the barriers that we might feel to, um, to DEI work. And so if you're feeling those barriers, don't fret. There are ways to get around them. And we as a community can have discussions and come up with creative solutions to work these things out. Speaking of as a community having discussions, we will enter Q&A shortly after this, and uh, I think you'll just look for the Zoom link from Renegade Opera. And I would love to see any and all of you in that Zoom room. It would be great to get your perspectives, to hear any feedback you have to offer, to discuss any questions you might have, and to think about these uh, these issues more broadly, if there are any experiential uh stories folks want to share or anything of that nature. We welcome anyone and everyone and any kind of uh, engagement. Thank you so much for engaging today. And I will just end by going through some thanks and showing you the bibliography that I've been mentioning throughout this presentation. Hey, hello everybody, I'm Danielle. I'm obviously part of the Renegade team. Um, Bethany, thank you so much for that presentation. I am living for it. I'm so stoked. It was so awesome. So thank you again so much. And I think everybody here is probably just as stoked as I am about it. Um, we did get some great questions. I have a lot of questions too, but let's start with the important ones from our wonderful patrons. Um, so the first one is from Alec, and he asked a question, I think you saw it in the chat, about if um, your resources might, or you don't know how, or, well, okay, I'll just read it. <laughs> if access to proper percussion and percussion players are limited by things like budget, public schools, or budget, parentheses, public school choirs, for example, is there still a respectful way to honor those traditions while using the resources you have access to? Yeah, this is a great question. And before I answer it, just a quick thank you to Renegade Opera, to everybody who put this together. I really appreciate the space to chat about it. And thanks to everybody who attended. And thank you for all your comments. They were great to follow along and for sticking around for this Q&A, because like I said at the beginning of this conversation, it's just so important to have these conversations because so much of this is in process. You know, we're all figuring it out and working it out in our individualized context. And a special shout out to Danielle, who helped me really fine tune a lot of this research over time and is helping me produce the larger website. Um, so Alec, to your question, a fabulous question and very relevant to most of us in many of our performing contexts. Something that I will often do is if I don't have a professional cajon player, like for a Peruvian percussion instrument in my local area that I'm living in at the time, I will do some research, chat with my colleagues, chat with people in the area, see if I can't find someone who might be studying that instrument or if I could get someone to, to come to town. But again, like you're saying, public school, you might not have access to resources. So you can make substitutions. Like if you absolutely have to use a bongo in place of a cajon, for example, that's okay. The more important thing is having gone through the process of informing yourself, why was the cajon used? How would it have been played? Was there a specific uh, important piece of relevance to the use of that instrument? And then the next step is communicating that to your audience. So sure. Use the bongo. Make sure you get somebody to play it who's at the same professional level as the other people playing other instruments. So if you have uh, students playing other instruments and other pieces, great. You can have a student play the bongo for this. But if you have professional pianist playing, you should probably get a professional percussionist to play the bongo if you're able to, right? That would be the best. Again, if you still have uh, 
barrier to those financial resources and you really need to use uh, a student, that's also okay. But again, communicating then that piece to your audience. So again, so much of that is just like this process. It has to be about communication and dialogue with your audience. So whatever decision you make, just be transparent with your audience. This piece should have a cajon for this reason. It carries this background. It should be played by a professional player. We are very grateful to have uh, Janelle playing the cajon for us today. She's an eighth grade student and she you know, has stepped in and we're, we're really grateful. And just giving them context, I think. Would anybody else like to offer any other insight into that? Those would be my first thoughts is provide context, have transparent discussion about it and make informed choices as much as you're able. Yeah, I think that's like so awesome. I'm just like, um, well, basically just saying what you were um, saying before. It's like the communication is the important part. And it just made me think a lot. Ugh, I'm still like reeling over how awesome your presentation was, but it's kind of like the same if you put it in a classical context. Like if you're performing Wagner, you can't not talk about anti Semitism. Like you have mm -hmm. to. So, um, if you're like a uh, colonizing culture, as the American, like the American culture is, then you can't like not talk about, oh, this uh, instrument was used in this way and it should be used in this way and we're doing our best and that's okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's fabulous. And the comment about Wagner goes to, on the last side, there was a, a comment just to give context and tell a true history. That's straight from Danielle, actually, the tell a true history line. And again, yeah, providing context, even when we're doing performance of Western European or otherwise white traditions. And just saying, you know, what really was the context for this? What were the messages sent through this? And who who was this composer? Great. We had another question um, from Elliot, right? Yeah. What are some traditional Western audition practices you wish choral organizations and other music groups would interrogate, challenge, and change? And this is a whole section on um, the website that we're working up. I'll kind of read through some of the things. So... A really helpful thing to do is just think about community engagement in general. So to be making auditions accessible to the whole community. So oftentimes the way that we set up practices now is either to not hold auditions at all. In the professional choral world, oftentimes we just hand pick people. So like even in border crossing in our first year, I literally just handed Ahmed a list of the people that I thought were really great and he hired all of them. And that's typically how professional performances work. And so there's a reforming of that, right? Actually audition, allow people you don't know to come into the space so you don't become this really exclusive and siloed thing going on that tends to be self-selective and exclusive. And then um, as you do make things accessible, think about the barriers that might occur. So there might be financial barriers in terms of if people need to pay for their pianist, their accompanist. Um, so try to provide free auditions for folks. It's something that's gonna benefit you in the long run, try to make that possible. Don't charge people to audition for your group. Um, make it accessible. So offer to hold auditions in various locations or online in some capacity. So if you're holding your auditions in the area where you typically do performance, uh, that maybe tends to be a super white neighborhood that has no diversity in it and is really exclusive and can't be reached by bus or can't be right. You're going to be not accessible to a lot of communities that can't reach that can't reach you. Um, those are just some some thoughts. And um, let me see which ones I overlooked here. Publicizing auditions also to all communities. So instead of just getting the word out through word of mouth, like telling your church choir and uh, you know, telling your friends in the professional choral world, hey, we're looking for, for new singers, actually like getting out around town and having partnerships around town that allow you to get that out. So a lot of it is backed up by having previously set up partnerships across your whole community with everybody in your community so that you're engendering real relationships um, diversely across, across all of our communities so that we have communities to pull from and communities to, to relate to. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, hi. Um, I really appreciate uh, everything you're saying as a Latina. Um, I very much um, was anxiety ridden over attending this because most of these things, you know, I get a little cringy, but um, I'm happy to say that that was not the case this time. So I, I, I appreciate that in of itself. But also, you know, on the back of what you said, you know, I will, you know, there's a 
I have a handful of um, uh, people of color uh, friends that are people of color who are professional musicians. We often are in dialogue and in support of each other as we struggle, have struggled to, you know, maintain our career or have have a career in this field, which it's hard for everybody, right? Um, and uh, uh, so access is huge. It's access is so, so, so huge. And I can't say this enough. And I don't even know that I can even, if I have the words to describe just how huge this is, because um, again, uh, you know, growing up as a Latina in, in trying to access uh, and have an operatic career, um, it you know when you come from a culture that doesn't it's it doesn't necessarily celebrate um westernized um colonial music necessarily understanding how to even show up for auditions what to do all of that kind of stuff is is a challenge there's a there's a real cultural language barrier on how to how to bridge how to make that bridge and have that access so um I just wanted to pipe in to say absolutely yes. I need to have a lot more conversations around just this and talk about the challenge, the barriers of communities like mine that I grew up in that wanting to get into these areas, wanting to participate, but there is we like I don't feel like I grew up having access or immediate knowledge into how one even does a thing you know and and just getting the information um that off what I have discovered is automatic in other people's cultures like people grow up with this language and understand it a lot more mm -hmm. and so um not to say that I have a, a brilliant solution but I just applaud the fact that the conversation is being had it's an important one for sure. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention, and it's only in an effort to be helpful, is that my community, my Mexican community is still struggling with a very strong machismo element in that. And, and, and our language is very gendered. There's a lot of, you know, feminine, masculine. It's, it's, it's really complicated. And while, it, it makes sense to say Latinx, just understand that our, our language and culture isn't there yet. Um, you, even in an effort to be inclusive, you're con you might cause confusion for people whose language is extremely gendered. There's, mm -hmm. Everything is, is, you know, has a gender to it. And so for, for generations, older generations, they're just not going to understand it. And, you know, we're all, all of us young Latinos are, we're trying to educate our elders, but it's, it just understand that just because younger generations of us are hip and understanding doesn't mean that everyone is and that everyone's on board. So just something to think about when you say Latinx, you know, Latinx is not, it, it's intended to be inclusive. We're just not there yet. And so you could inadvertently exclude just by using that mm -hmm. as a white person. And I just want mm -hmm. you to be aware of why that is. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing your perspective, Lynn, and for being willing to share your history and your personal experience too. It's yeah. so important for all of us to be hearing your story and to be hearing how you think about things. Um, I think you're absolutely... It, it's so helpful to hear you speak about access and think about access as something that is a lifelong process and has to go way back, way before the, we get to the audition. Like we're talking yeah. about access in the audition. It starts decades before way. someone gets to that audition. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's making our education systems way more accessible from the time people are kids, making it something that's a more accessible part of a, a cultural piece. And that's something that we're bringing into the DEI website as well, which is we're thinking about ways that choral artists, and I don't know what you think about this, Lynn, about um, ways that choirs can, can integrate training programs that are free and integrated with the community into, into things so that 
intergenerational conversations can be had. You know, folks all the way from kids to older folks can be getting involved in singing. We have things like um, choral scholars who can sing with our choirs. So Border Crossing has that as part of what we do. We have an intergenerational uh, group called Heritage Choir that we just started that um, brings in folks to specifically share their cultural histories. And it can become like a funnel group into the professional group so that folks can train in heritage choir and or just enjoy the experience and have a good experience and then possibly go to get a professional uh, work from that. And then specifically with Latinx, thank you for the feedback. It's really helpful for me to hear. Um, the, the team that I have, including Danielle, who's putting all of this together, actually most of the group uh, identifies as Latinx. It's, uh, mm -hmm. So I've been very lucky to work with, I, I think there are eight people in the, in the group for Latinx. And we have gone back and forth on that exact conversation. Yeah. We, yeah. We decided to go with Latinx because yep. it is that, you know, um, forward thinking move, but it we are is. constantly having this conversation about how can we make it intergenerationally accessible um, to folks. And I think that happens across many language situations. Because that, that term alone, it's kind of, it's, it's a shove in the absolute right direction. So I applaud it. And the, the thing about it is it, it will falsely give the impression that we're there when we're actually so aren't. Mm. And, and, you know, it's like putting like put, slapping a label before it's even been packaged yet and properly mm. processed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, Yeah. Absolutely. I take no offense or issue with that term. I, mm -hmm. I use it boldly and proudly. Mm -hmm. And I'm still in conversation with my Mexican community who doesn't understand it. They don't get it yet. And, and they're, it's going to take time. But it's, I only bring it up because saying it is not, does not signify wokeness yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah, we're just not there, but I applaud anybody who wants to use it. I just kind of want to give some context for how I perceive my community on board with that term and not on board with that term. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, a, it's especially helpful. I mean, your comment that for me as a white person to be saying that too is also yeah. carries all of these, you know, layers of messaging around it. So well, for me, just to it be was just like, by the way, do you know that this is going on in my community? Honestly, that's mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. only place that I was coming from. Like, are you even mm -hmm. aware that we're not quite there yet? We're working on it, but, but sure. Yeah, like any, that, that's always a question that comes up in my mind when, when someone who, you know, not from my community that's yeah. using Latinx as if that's the given and everybody's accepting of it. It's like, right. oh, I would love to say yes, but we're, we're still working on it. We're mm -hmm. getting there. And I appreciate you using it. I'm not saying that I'm offended by it. I'm not. Mm -hmm. It's just always a question in my mind. Like, are you, but you do realize we're not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have got a lot of machismo to work and wrestle <laughs> before we get to that place. But mm -hmm. yeah, but I was gonna, so my thought is bravo. I applaud it. I think this is wonderful. We need a partnership and more importantly, collab collaboration right and so it I love that you're collaborating with people that can help that and for me that feels right that feels genuine if you're going to be entering in any culture it feels right to be in partnership with someone from that culture mm -hmm. instead of trying to use the culture to prove that you're a good person yeah and I think there's great ways of proving that you're a good person I probably you probably don't have to work that hard it's just that you know, for for inclusivity to feel genuine and and impactful in our in our cultures, partnership has to be a component of it. You know, yep. having that in there so that it's so that you have a partner to wrestle together is is an important part of that. Mm -hmm. I will give you an example. Like growing up as a kid, I was always singing in choirs because I just from a very young age was just I just knew music was my thing so I joined any choir I could possibly join that my parents would allow me but it was always a struggle it was a fight they didn't value singing in choir even though they valued music in terms of a family it was always a family gathering like the 
the familia can be given. We all sang into the evening and played multiple instruments, and that was not a problem. Mm-hmm. But for it to be in the context of a choral setting or something organized like that, where okay, you guys, you have to go pay a ticket and go and perform, that was kind of lost on my my family. I would often go to so many concerts. I was a part of, and my family, nobody showed up. Nobody was there. Whereas conversely, all my white friends that were in those concerts had their extended family there taking pictures of the yin yang. And they were fully supported in that, in that experience of it. Whereas I was all by myself and I had to get a ride and I had to figure out that nav- I had to navigate how to be part of a musical world when my, my family didn't support it. The first time my mother saw me in an opera, I was, you know, 24. And I, you know, she didn't, she, she came and she saw it and she, afterwards she said, oh, that's what you do. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's just our community just had it caught. They just don't value it the way so many other cultures and communities value it. And so I do, so a component of this I'm thinking is that we need to educate communities like the ones that I grew up in, my Mexican community, that it can be a subject along the lines of math and science and all of that so that it can help my community understand that there is value outside of just coming up with a performing degree because no one wanted to say that their child was going to be an opera singer or a a musician that was not a desired profession. Medical, fine. Lawyer, great. That that brings up a family status, financial status. It brings up some respect that the community is dying for and never gets, right? But music, not so much. And so it's just the awareness that, okay, yes, we need to go in there and actually educate how it's valuable how you the why you even want to show up to your kids concert how about that <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. there's a lot of work there yeah and it seems a lot of that is again related with cultural accessibility and making things just part of life and making things things that people could feel like they could attend and be a part of that and maybe if yeah. concerts were uh more culturally accessible as well maybe concert statements were given in spanish as well or given in multiple languages when if concerts were printed in multiple language things like that making spaces feeling uh feel more welcoming and more like they can be an actual integrated part of life rather than like this white thing that white people do i think can sometimes be a helpful way to change it does that sound right yeah, yeah, absolutely. In San Diego, we had premiered a uh, mariachi uh, opera, and it, you know, was sold out in a day because all the Mexicans came. We all came. We all were like, "Yes, that that we will see." And we <laughs> saw one of the the nation's top performing mariachis come in, and and it was beautiful, and it was a beautiful story. And I applauded San Diego Opera for doing that. I was so immensely proud of them for doing that. Um, And and it brought us out in droves. And I was so proud just of my community willing to pay the money and support it and fund it. Um, And, you know, that's just an example of, yes, we're, we're working hard, right? All of us. We're working so hard to try and make this cultural gap or bridge, you know, but that's another example of that actually taking place. Mm-hmm. That's been. And then I don't want to. I don't want to take up the entire time, so I'll I'll release it and let other people talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your perspective. I mean, the, these are the conversations we need to be having. So I yeah, really exactly. really appreciate that yeah. perspective. Yeah, Danielle, were you going to say something? Oh no, I was just going to say thanks, Lynn. That's awesome. Um, that's a great conversation, and um, I think we just have one more question from Elliot, actually. Um, what are the traditional Western audition practices you wish choral organizations and other music groups would interrogate, challenge, and change? Yeah, and this is the one we were kind of talking about a second ago, too, just thinking about making it accessible, publicizing it across town, making real, like Lynn was talking about, making real partnerships and real relationships with people that are authentically, you know, integrated diversely across all of our communities. Um, 
and then backing way up, making making things accessible from early ages and making our concerts accessible, welcoming language, like like Liza was just saying. I also, if it's okay, just wanted to comment on a couple of Liza's comments here. Liza, you've had so many helpful comments, so thank you for those. Um, yeah, you're I, welcome. Yeah, I, I don't know how much time we have left, Maddie and, and Renegade, but Liza, I don't know if you wanted to speak to can any you, of your... Okay, yeah. <laughs> is it okay? Sure. Cool. So I, I don't know if you want to speak specifically to any of them or if you... Oh, yeah. Would, if, yeah. I will. I will speak to... I'll, I'll talk your ear off. Um, as Maddie will attest to, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, I um, am part of a queer chorus. And I also... Um, so there's that. And then I... Um, I also attend a um, creative and performing arts program for adults with disabilities, and I sing in a choir with with that group. And so, um, I I kind of feel like that's maybe a double whammy. <laughs> um, I I feel like um, I, I don't know. I I, I guess. Um, well, I guess I'll, first I'll talk about access since that was kind of the, the thing that was brought up. Um, of course, cultural access and, um, and having it be, uh, a welcoming space, but also physically accessible. I feel like, um, it's really important and often overlooked to, um, to have the space the rehearsal space and the performance space be ADA accessible, um, to have the option for chairs. Um, you know, so often in choir performances, you have risers and I know I can't, I can't stand there on a riser. I'll fall on my face. Um, and have that be normalized, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, you know, um, I, I think um, in the trans choir or the gender affirming choir I was part of um, had a lots of um, uh, different uh, differently abled people um, within that choir. So that was kind of the crossover that I experienced, I guess, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the beginning of every choir, the choir director asked who needs a chair who needs a chair with the arms? What's the situation? Um, and for concerts, we didn't. There was no real formal like um, riser situation. It was all we kind of gathered in a group, and it was it was more of an informal like, here's what we're singing and enjoy us. Um, and um, so I don't know. I'm I feel like I'm not making much sense. Um, I think that's my neurodiversity talking. <laughs> um, but I, um, so I, I've come from that perspective and I've also, um, I've also been in choirs that were, I don't know, for lack of a better term, viewed as more professional or, um, I don't know, just a little bit more um, traditional or more uh, established. And um, I have felt a little bit uncomfortable. And so it's really important to call in um, just different experiences. And, mm -hmm. and with the whole trans uh, conversation, um, to not have gender language gender language, um, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, mm -hmm. um, you know, use languages like higher voices, lower voices, mm -hmm. um, and realize that women can be tenors and basses too. Um, in fact, uh, the Portland Lesbian Choir that I'm a part of, you know, lots of the women are basses <laughs> and, I think in a more traditional choir, that's not something that is um, 
represented or mm -hmm. even celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's, that's a long answer and I'm that's not great. really sure if it's an answer. <laughs> no, it's fabulous. Yeah. And I'm, I, I really benefit from hearing it. Um, oh, good. <laughs> and I think especially just it helps me rethink a couple of things. So a lot of this mm -hmm. I'm happy to hear is in the document that, that Danielle and a couple of us have been putting yeah. together. Um, I think what I don't have in there yet is the, the specific um, language, which is a very clear and very important one to not say yeah. soprano and to say, you know, for women, women don't, you know, women go sing this. It's just yeah. such a common thing or, to say rather than high voices go, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Um, or, um, or, um, I don't know, I, again, going back to the, um, the gender firm inquiry I was in is having the, the space to switch vocal parts. If, mm. if your voice changed or if you were on testosterone, which a lot of people were mm -hmm. in that group or, you know, and making that okay. Mm -hmm. Um, that's fabulous. Just, just saying like, Hey. We're all here to sing and have fun. It's mm -hmm. not, you know. And also, I want to kind of um, talk about the written music versus learning by rote or by ear. Um, I used to read music, but not so much anymore. <laughs> um, I can kind of um, recognize intervals and like, okay, this is, you know, this is that. But um, making that okay and making rehearsal recordings available pretty early on in the process is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for me, having lots of communication around different needs um, in terms of accessibility, both physical and emotional and, you know, Whatever it may be, mm -hmm. um, just having that open dialogue. Yeah, it sounds like the thread through everything that you were saying is communication and creating, whether it's at the beginning of rehearsal, the director asking who needs a chair and what kind of chair do you need? Or, you know, what voice part do you identify with? Or asking people how they want to be referred to, what their pronouns are, or actually creating a physical space that is both accessible and also, maybe you take down that third wall or is it the fourth wall, whatever yeah. number wall it is. The fourth just, one. Yeah, the, that fourth wall. And uh, having, um, having you know, these less formal or less traditional gathering spaces mm -hmm. where we can more yeah. genuinely engage in dialogue yeah. with one another. And it feels like, because right. so much of our traditional way of presenting music is us versus them. And we, just like my lecture to you all, where I just through information at you and yeah. then we don't have this process of people on the other side of things feeling like they can actually engage and offer feedback and be part yeah. of the process. Well, and also um that just reminded me of there's um um especially in the queer community but not but not always there I mean there's everybody experiences trauma <laughs> but um there are certain pieces that might have more sensitive subject matter and having like a de stim room or some mm. sort of space to be like, okay, if you need to take a break, here's where you can do that and sing that before the choir concert or, um, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Or, um, yeah. That's great. That's really great. Yeah. Uh, we, used, we used to do with Border Crossing at some of our community concerts we would have in in a church and I was working at that time with um, children who had autism mm -hmm. and we would have de stem rooms and so one yeah. of the things that we created was allowing folks to have this separate room to have a de stem room but also allowing during the concert if kids wanted to run around in the back and make noise yeah. we just became okay right. with that yeah and that has been a really really cool part of our process yeah, is that's not one of that that's one of the things we did for because I also um I act with fame too. And, um, we actually worked with the Portland opera, um, I guess two years ago now, um, the summer before the shutdowns and we did an all original opera 
and we had a special evening where it was like a, um, I think they called it a low stimulation um, performance where it was low light, low stage lights. You could um, interact however you needed to. If you needed to make noise, um, leave the space, you could. So that's great. I think, I think that's important to, mm-hmm. to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if I can add just a little thing here, I think as I totally in agreement with all of those things and and as leaders in groups, we have a lot of sway over how people uh, interact with Mm -hmm. audience members, with other choir members, right. With other ensemble members, like we have this power to say to the audience at the beginning of the concert, children are allowed to run around, like welcome everyone, you know, to, to make sure that the audience is on that same page and that we're kind of inviting people to join that conversation and to be open to these different things without just sort of slapping it on there and being like, Mm -hmm. it's happening. Right. But inviting people in and saying, yeah, we've decided to make these, you know, these changes, this might look a little different than your typical traditional Mm -hmm. choir concert. And we're doing this for this, this reason. And we'd love to talk to you more about it, but just so you know, here's where we're at, you know, Mm -hmm. that can be a really affirming thing to do as a, as a leader. Yeah. Well, and I think it makes everyone feel so much more comfortable too. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sets the tone in a different way. Whereas like, I think a lot of times, like what Maddie, you're referring to, you can say something on paper and say at the front, the front of the program, say children are welcome. But Mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe the musicians in the corner are like, well, that kid was screaming and I hated it. And, you know, but the director can set that tone and really like set, set it up for all of us to have this expectation and make that a a wonderful thing and be talking about it with your musicians too. Oh, this is just such a great conversation. Thank you so much. This helps me as much as (laughs) anything else I'm taking out here. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that can be overlooked I think, but that's kind of the point of this whole thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So. I might just say in closing, if, if folks, I'm sure Renegade will want to close here, but just all, I'm going to write my email down here. If anybody wants to shoot me a message or um, be part of any of this work in the future, I think for me, just hearing your perspectives is like I was saying, just selfishly, it's helpful for me as I think about putting together these materials and making them really representative of different voices. So if anybody wants to be a part of that process, feel free to shoot me an email. I would love to continue these conversations with you individually in this part of groups. Yeah, Liza, feel free to just shoot me an email. (laughs) I'll add you to our list. And uh, well, yeah, we'll be really enriched by all of these conversations. So I just really invite everybody to, to get in touch if that's something that interests you. And thank you so much to Renegade. Thank you.